a while ago, I made a video which gave clarity and closure to two specific syntax scenarios. Number one, why a vowel in front of a consonant at the beginning of a word is a part of particle of negation and means no. And number two, why two vowels in front of a consonant at the beginning of a word is positive performance. You can find a link to that up here. In that video, I also said that I was going to make a video, another video with a dry erase board, giving further closure and clarity to these matters. And this is it. I'm not sure what form it's going to take, whether it's going to be several videos in a series or whether it's going to be one long one edited together. We'll see. Now this video uh, will require a certain level of correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, knowledge on the viewer's part in order to process what I'm going to be sharing with you. Because I have found that with my students, no matter what sector of the quantum grammar community they come from, even if they know how to syntax, they do not have closure on why they bank the values that they do. They can bank the values, they can put the, the adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun, one, two, three, four, but they are not able to say why the adverb's an adverb or the adjective's an, ad an adjective. Hopefully this will help. To begin with, and all of this comes from etymology online. To begin with, the verb uh, comes from 14th century Old French, word, word of God. Also, even further back from the 12th century, it's a part of speech that expresses action. From the Proto-Indo-European root W-E-R-E, -E, which means to speak, and in Hittite it means summon or call. So a verb expresses action. And in order to express action, you must think. You have to think pretty much to do anything. So a verb is thinking, action, movement. Next we have the adverb, which we are told is an indeclinable part of speech. And I'll leave it up to the viewer to get closure on what indeclinable means. So it's indeclinable part of speech for limiting or extending a verb's function. So they're telling you right here that the adverb limits or extends a verb's function, i.e. it modifies a verb. In syntax terms, for those of you who are students of mine and have watched my videos, there are two different groupings of terms. One is tangible contract fact-based words, i.e. words that are based on a fact and we have a tangible contract with, and non-tangible contract words, non-fact-based words, words that we don't have a tangible contract with. So a verb can be either of those. It can be tangible contract or non-tangible contract. An adverb can only be non-tangible contract. Because by the very um, fiction definition of it here, it's just a modifier. It's an abstract concept. AD verb. So we're told in the fiction that AD is equivalent to TO, to. It negates the now time. It's not now time, it's, it's a no verb. Next, we have adjective, <clears throat> which is used to qualify, limit, or define a no-no, a noun. Comes from Proto-Indo-European Y-E, which means to throw, near a thing. So throw it, uh, an adjective is projecting something towards a thing, towards a noun. Again, A-D-J-E-C, <clears throat> to throw. So it's not to throw, actually. <laughs> it's confusing, I know. So let's move on to the pronoun. The no, 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 which means in place of a noun. 
So a pronoun can be any word in language. Quite literally. An adjective in the terms of those two groups I just shared with you. An adjective would only be a tangible contract word. A fact-based word. Whereas a pronoun, much the same as the verb, could be a tangible contract word or a non-tangible contract word. Because it's in place of a noun, a name. It's in, it could be in place of any word in the English language. So I've pretty much just given you clarity and closure as to what the functions are of the two, one, three, and four in the correct sentence structure. This is verb thinking. This is a modifier of the verb thinking or the modifier of the adjective, the tangible contract coloring, or it can also be a modifier of itself, of another adverb. And a pronoun is, be, is either standing by itself, representing any word in the English language, or it's being colored by a tangible contract adjective. For the closure, I'm going to go through each one of those four terms that you saw in the preceding board, and I'm going to give you my quantum grammar finite means of those words taken from the dictionary that governs my construct and my contracts, which I have co-authored as a lexicographer. So we have, for the adverb of this finite mean is, with the claim of the modification, with the fact of the creation, with the function of the verb, with the syntax certification by a fiction language author, and authors, period. For the oiti of the adverb is with the claim of the placement with the front of a term, with the cause of the modification, with the function of a verb or adjective, with the syntax closure and certification by an author, period. What I'm basically telling you is that in the fiction, the adverb modifies, limits, or extends the meaning of a verb. And in the correct sentence structure, it's a modifier of a verb or an adjective. In the previous section of the video, I did say that an adverb can also modify another adverb. However, in my construct that this dictionary governs, I don't use that function. So in my construct, the adverb is a modifier of a verb or an adjective. Next up, we have verb. For the verb of this finite mean is, with the claim of the state, with the condition of the cogitation, with the two words, is and are, by the contract terms, period. Next, we have adjective. For the adjective of the finite mean is with the claim of the modification, with the facts of the creation, with the location of the conjecture, with the damage of those facts, with the syntax certification by a fiction, language, author, and authors, period. Now, the way I'm reading this verbally um, reflects an interpretation of it for the ease of the communication. Closure on the forward slash, forward slash means and. And as far as the closure for the colons, I do have a video on that and you can find closure to that. I'll leave a link to it up there. And also I have created a, a document written in plain English for the ease of the communication for those beginning students which also explains the use of the full colon as I'm doing it here, which is mathematically certified. And you can email me at jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com for that closure. 
And now for the final one, for the pronoun of this finite mean is with the claim of the vacate, with the location of the claim, with the modification by the fiction language author and authors, period. Next, we have to go into a little bit about what a vowel is and what a consonant is. And in the etymology dictionary, we see that a vowel comes from 13th century means to speak. It's a voice. And then going back even, even further to Proto-Indo-European W-E-K-W means speak. And then when you follow that, continue to the evidence, you come to this word, mention. Now, we know that M-E-N means mental, mind, and an I-O-N is contract. So a vowel is a contract with thinking. On the other hand, a consonant comes from 14th century alphabetic element other than a vowel. It also means sounding together to make a noise. So then we look up uh, the, uh, we parse the word and look at the elements. C-O-N means together. A-N-T is contract. And then we have S-O-N, which comes from Proto-Indo-European S-W-E-N, which means sound. So we're going from a concept of speaking, a contract with the thinking, to being together with the contract of a sound. Once more for the closure, I'll share my finite means of consonant and vowel from my quantum grammar dictionary. For the consonant of this finite mean is with the claim of the contract, with the finite sound of the character and letter, with the conveyance by this claim, period. For the vowel of this finite mean is with the claim of the character and letter, with the flow of the sound, with the connection of the consonant, with this conveyance by this claim, period. I'm inserting this section in this video for a twofold purpose. Number one, to break up the monotony of the classroom. And number two, because I finished shooting the entire video and realized that I had left one part out that I wanted to cover. And so I'm going to insert this uh, in between the parts where I give closure to the terms and conditions and then the closure on the two syntax scenarios. So I wanted to cover more on what a vowel and what a consonant is or are. So if you think about a vowel, think about the actual sound of a vowel. A, E, I, O, U. A, E, I, O, U. These are vowels. There's not really a solidity to them in a conceptual sense. In the same way that there's a solidity to consonants. You can't go, you, you can't let a B go on. Like the letter B, it's B, B. If you want to extend a B, it's B, and now you're doing an E, you're doing a vowel sound, B, because it goes on forever. There's no closure to a vowel sound. Really, where in the same sense that there's a closure to B, a consonant, a constant, tangible contract versus non-tangible contract. C, D, some are hard, some are a little soft, but there's still a solidity to the consonant, to the fact-based word that there is not with the vowel non-fact-based, non-tangible contract word. I hope this will help in what you're going to watch next. Keep this in mind uh, for your clarity and closures on the vowel, the consonant, the adverb, adjective, uh, pronoun, verb scenarios, and the tangible contract fact-based word versus 
the non-tangible contract, non-fact-based word. Now that we've established some groundwork, a foundation with which to build from, meaning we've given clarity what a consonant is, to what a vowel is, to what an adverb, verb, adjective, and pronoun, what those are. Let's we'll start with this word, and we're going to examine the first syntax scenario, vowel in front of consonant is a particle of negation. This word, America, period. Out of those four syntax values, which value would you bank on that word? What value would you give that word? It's all by itself. If you don't know any language, if you don't know how to speak plain English, what would you say that is? Given the closure that I shared with you on those four parts of speech. It would be a pronoun because it's by itself and it's in the place of whatever. It can be any word representative of any word in the English language, any no-no, any name. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it apart. So what I've done is I've broke the continuance of the evidence in this word. In this word, there are no spaces between the characters. Now there are. There's a space in between the characters. Therefore, each letter, each character is going to be taken as an entity in and of itself that would therefore require closure and a value to be banked upon it. So we see a vowel, a consonant, a vowel, a consonant, a vowel, a consonant, and a vowel. The syntax of terms, each term depends upon the terms around it. In other words, the syntax, you can't really just go into a document and say, oh, that's going to be an adverb, that's going to be a verb. You have to look at the entire scenario. You have to look at the scenario around it. And those are simple rule one, rule equal judge mechanics. You have to take the whole of the situation into consideration before you bank those values. So here we have an A, known in language as a vowel. And what is a vowel? It is a contract with thinking. It is thinking, it is motion, it is movement. So we're starting off with just an abstract here. And then we have a space. And then we have a consonant, which even with just the word consonant, it's, it's similar to constant. As I gave the example before, it's a, a sound as opposed to um, the thinking, the movement. So this... A is going to be an adverb, which is holy modification. I don't mean H-O-L-Y. I mean W-H-O. Forget I said that word. This is pure modification, modifying the consonant M into a verb. Non-tangible contract-based, non-fact-based, abstract concept fact-based concept, consonant. The adverb is modifying, limiting, or extending the function of this verb thinking. The adverb A is modifying your verb the thinking into an M. Next, we have an E. And then we have an R. Same scenario as here. Adverb, verb. Then we have I-C-A. Non-tangible contract, tangible contract, non-tangible contract. In this scenario, we have the adverb I, an abstract concept of modification in your mind, modifying the consonant C, the tangible contract word C, into an adjective 
which is now modifying the non-tangible contract A into a pronoun, which represents any word in the English language. As a rule of thumb and syntax, you can think of it this way. Non-tangible contract terms will not be adjectives. Tangible contract words will not be adverbs. So here we have a one, two, one, two, one, three, four scenario. Adverb, verb, adverb, verb, adverb, adjective, pronoun scenario. This is a particle of negation because it's a modifier. It's negating the whole thing from here on. Thus, a vowel in front of a consonant is no contract because it's just, there's nothing, there's not even anything to think about. It's just starting off with modification. Modifying everything in its path. Now I'm going to give you an example of why two vowels in front of a consonant is positive performance. One more thing. One more clarity. You have this vowel, this, this abstract modification concept in front of a consonant. You have not even a thinking, just a motion in front of a consonant. Uh, consonant. There's nothing to think about because there's nothing there. But when you do this, Now you have two vowels in front of a consonant. As it stands, author, of course, is a pronoun, same as America. But when you separate the particles, now you have a non-tangible contract, A, non-tangible contract, U, tangible contract, tangible contract, non-tangible contract, tangible contract. You would syntax this as, now let's start from the, from the end of it and work this way, which I found is the most efficient and easiest way to learn syntax. Tangible contract, and then you have the adverb modifying this into a verb. You can consider that done. Now we have a pronoun being modified, colored by another tangible contract, adjective. Then we have the adverb non-tangible contract U, that's done. Now we have the A standing by itself is a pronoun which represents any term in language that you can think of. The reason why the AU is positive performance in language when you put them together like this and position them correctly like that as opposed to this, now you have a vowel in front of a vowel. And this vowel serves the function of the life force. That's why these words with the two vowels in front are so powerful, like authority, earth, things like that. This serves the function of the life force, which now gives us something to think about with our verb of the thinking, moving it into the rest of the word. Life force, verb of the thinking, and the rest of the word, which goes into our correct sentence structure concepts, which my students are very familiar with, where you have, the, you have to put the two points before you put the verb of the thinking in to continue on. You have to have a fact you have to have established two facts before your verb of the thinking. So I've established a fact here. Now I can put a verb of the thinking, and now it's positive performance, much in the same way that we position a verb in the correct sentence structure. Think of it this way as well. If you have that, 
concept, and then you take that verb out, and you put it at the beginning, like in America, without anything before it, now the line's in question. We don't know where the line's going. That's why this is a question in correct sentence structure. Why you put the verb at the beginning of the, of the sentence. Much in the same way that there's a question and no closure on a word that has a vowel in front of a consonant at the beginning of it. That is why a vowel in front of a consonant at the beginning of a word is a particle of negation. Now, I've done the best that I could in this video to explain this, to try and condense it down in a fashion that's easily cognizable by the viewer. However, I do realize it's a very deep and complex topic. You can contact me in the confidential at jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com for further closures on this. I do provide workshops for these things for those who qualify, and in order to, order to apply for that, you would need to go through the venue of my email if you wish to come aboard my vessel. My vessel. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. This is probably the most complex video I've done so far, so I'm a little tongue-tied at the end here. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was helpful, and I hope you have a beautiful day. Thank you.